this is uh, super exciting. I when when I was waiting in the in the Zoom room, uh, and then they the organizers released the 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 attendees, and it's just such a large and impressive group of people that I got very intimidated. <laughs> so um, hopefully this will this will go okay. Um, it's you know, but it, but regardless, it's really cool to be here, and I uh, hope I can at least spur some interesting discussions, if nothing else. So my my talk is about logical planning in murky perceptual domains from soup to knots. Now, I, it occurs to me that that is maybe riffing on or doing wordplay on an expression that not everyone is familiar with, and I apologize for that. But soup to nuts is a, an expression in English which basically means everything from the beginning to the end, everything. But here, I'm just referring to the soup of perception to the knots, the logical knots, ands, ors, and, and so forth that we can use when we're trying to plan kind of uh, large numbers of steps into, into a domain. So uh, I don't have a solution to this problem. So if you were hoping that I did, you can probably clock out now. There's all sorts of fun things to do in GatherTown. Uh, but, uh, but I wanted to at least talk about where I think things are and why I think this is an important uh, thing. And in particular, I got thinking along these lines because the workshop is about the uh, bridging between planning and reinforcement learning. And that sort of surprised me that that should even be a workshop because like, obviously that's exactly what we need to be doing is bridging between planning and reinforcement learning. That's been the whole problem all along, but maybe not everybody sees it that way. So let me uh, kind of share my perspective with you and hopefully uh, we can all be on board together. So uh, we know that it is actually hard to plan in the real world. It's hard to, to be embedded in a real physical environment and then to think ahead as to how you're gonna actually carry out a sequence of actions that, that cause something to happen in the real world. But people can do it, right? So I have you know, kind of a little blocks world definition on the left and a little blocks world definition on the right. Uh, you know, baby stacking, stacking up blocks. This is just one example of a person that can, that can solve various kinds of planning problems. But, you know, all of us to some degree do this sort of thing. Uh, we can think ahead, we can, we can string actions together to get the job done. But I think it's kind of interesting that we're not the only critters in, in the physical world that can do this. Uh, there's some really beautiful examples, if you haven't seen these videos, of, of animals doing things that look a lot like planning domains. Uh, so this in particular is a picture of a, I think a Chalcedonian crow. And it is, uh, it had picked up a rock, which it had to get through this sequence of actions that it carried out to get this rock that it's going to now drop into that little hole in the picture, which is going to cause a little shelf to tilt and it's going to release some food. But you can actually, once the crows kind of understand how all the different things in its little environment, its human constructed environment work, it can actually sequence many different kinds of actions to accomplish goals. So it can drop a stone into the chute to get a stick out that it can then carry over to a place where with using its beak and the stick can pry some food out. Um, the sort of thing where it's clearly not just taking random actions and hoping something good happens, it's sequencing things in a very sensible and, and meaningful way. So crows do this. This next example I find really compelling, but some people it sort of grosses them out. But octopuses are amazing at doing all kinds of planning like things. Uh, so this is a video I found online. I'm not gonna play the video, but it's an octopus in the water because that's where octopuses you know, do their thing, octopi. Uh, and it's in a cage with a trap door and a big red button. And if it presses the red button, the trap door opens and the op octopus can escape. The octopus wants to escape because there's delicious fish swimming outside of its cage, but inside the water. And if it can get out, it can, you know, you know, do what octopuses do to little fish, which is, you know, we're not going to show that either. But, um, but again, the, the, the activity that the octopus has to do involves sequencing pretty deep uh, sets of actions, swimming over to the button, orienting itself so it can push the button, pushing the button, getting to where the door, the gate is, getting out the gate, and ultimately eating, eating the fish. So we have all these different critters in the world that can do this. Uh, can deep reinforcement learning do this? Can it kind of think ahead and solve problems? And so this is an example from a, a, a video game from the Atari data set called Amidar uh, that we trained up with deep reinforcement learning, DQL, the kind of celebrated deep mind uh, kind of first attempt at solving these kinds of Atari video games. And uh, 
all right, so let me play it. So, the, so there's, this is a game that's kind of like Pac-Man, if you know Pac-Man, but the yellow creature is us. And we're trying to move around on the grid, not getting touched by those little purple creatures. They're, they're, they're out to get us. If we make contact with them, the game over, the, the, the round is over, we lose a life. And you can see this, this character is actually doing a pretty good job of dodging, sometimes quite close to these enemies. Um, ultimately, what it's trying to do is surround each of those boxes by traveling around all four sides of the boxes. Once it gets all the way around a box, it fills in and points are released. If it can do that to all the boxes on the screen, more points are released, the screen ends, and the agent gets to move to the next level. So that was what a trained agent looks like. Here's another uh, trained agent. You can see, again, it's, it's, it's so smart, right? It's like going up to the, to the enemies, just up to them, and then moving out of the way just at the right moment so that it can systematically kind of lawnmower around the grid, covering all the different pieces. You know, it seems to know just what to do and just when to do it. And um, it plays pretty decently. It's, it's, it's not uh, sort of human expert quality, but it's obviously playing quite well. All right, so you can look at that and think, great, you know, we're at octopus level, right? We can actually build uh, systems in machine learning, uh, reinforcement learning systems that can do pretty deep planning. But the fact of the matter is, even this example is not as good as it seems. So if you actually perturb the environment, even just a little bit, so um, I'm not, what I'm about to show you is that same game, but we've pre-filled one of the boxes, but otherwise it's the same. Here's what we see the agent doing. It sits there and it dies. Here, let's watch that again because it was so entertaining. Oh, whoops. Ah, all right. We're gonna watch it one more time. This is the screen on the left. So the agent cleverly positions itself for death. All right, so, uh, well, maybe that's unfair. It doesn't see enemies but one, but leave the grid exactly as it was. And now we see an agent that sits there. Oh, it dodged out of the way. Now it's in the middle of the grid, convulsing. Then it settles down and nothing ever happens again. So there's, there's a real sense in which these agents are not planning in any kind of meaningful way. They're not thinking about what's going on in the environment, applying what they know and deciding what to do to make something happen. They've just learned how to kind of twitch their way through the environment in a way that generates points. So I, my sense is that they're not really doing anything that I would call planning. So state of the art, at least circa five years ago, reinforcement learning is not in, in this kind of complex uh, sensory kind of environment where it's actually going from the pixels to decisions about how to move. It's not doing any kind of smart planning. So, so what do I mean when I talk about planning and reinforcement learning? So to me, planning and reinforcement learning are just two problems. And they're actually fairly similar problems. So I think of reinforcement learning as the problem of taking an experience about an environment and outputting a policy, a, a way of behaving in that environment. Whereas planning takes in a model of the environment, doesn't have to interact with the environment, it just gets a description, and then can use that to actually decide what to do, to, make, to take actions and, and execute a policy. So they both spit out policies, but that's not the, the, the similarity doesn't end there. Uh, they're even more similar than that. In particular, and this is maybe why people kind of blur the distinctions between them, is that you can solve a planning problem using it by, by mapping it to a reinforcement learning problem. So simulation-based planning, the idea is that we take in a model of the environment. So it could be, uh, it could be a video game, but it, maybe it's more like a, a board game or something like that. You can then simulate living in that world to generate experience and then apply a reinforcement learning algorithm, like a temporal difference algorithm or, or DQN or something like that to spit out a policy. So yeah, it's doing reinforcement learning, but it's doing reinforcement learning in service of planning, of taking a model of the environment and turning it into a way to behave. Similarly, if we wanna solve reinforcement learning problem, we wanna go from experience to a policy, we can think of it as a planning problem. We can turn that experience into a model by learning the model and then feed that model to a planning algorithm to actually generate behavior. And that's what we call model-based reinforcement learning. And to me, like that's, that's, what, that's the problem that I wanna see solved and that I wanna, if I can help, I would like to help solve that problem because I think that's sort of, that's very close to the essence of intelligence as far as I'm concerned. This idea of being able to experience things in the world, turn them into some kind of description of how the world works and then to reason about that world to take meaningful actions in it. All right, so maybe I'll maybe I'll pause for a second, or do we want to 
do we want to oh my goodness there's 18 things in the chat 19 things in the chat and i can't see the chat so i should ignore the chat Hector you should saying, ignore the chat indeed there's, there's nothing to see we, here. we take care of it all right all right so this is kind of we're just going to jedi this away all right so um great all right, I apologize if I'm not being responsive to your questions that are at the moment invisible to me, but um, okay, I will just press on then. So I, what I wanted to get across though is this, this idea that um, from my perspective, model-based reinforcement learning is where planning and reinforcement learning come together in a way that I think is important and also very, very challenging. And I think it's worth pointing out, I know a lot of people here have thought about this and contributed really important uh, pieces to our understanding of this, but if you haven't thought about it very much, it's natural to think, wait a second, a model learner, that's like a supervised learning problem because you're getting lots of data about, oh, the world looked like this and I behaved this way and, and, and um, I'm not sure if, if I'm getting a signal. Okay, uh, okay. So uh, a supervised learning problem in that you're, 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 the world is a certain way, you take some actions in the world and you observe how the world changes. And that's what a model is trying to do. It's trying to predict how does the world change as a function of, of the action. So that's just a supervised learning problem. And planning, well, you know, we solved planning, <laughs> you know, ish. Uh, and so we just glue these things together and we're done. But it turns out that you can't just use the best learning algorithm, learn the model and then use the best planner and we've got everything we need for a couple of reasons. So one is the model learner itself needs the planner to generate useful data. So if you're just collecting data, for example, by just twitching in the environment, by just moving at random in the environment, not intentionally, not, not mean not in a planful sort of way, that will often give you data that's not particularly useful for learning a very rich and thorough model of the environment. So uh, this, was, this was well known in the you know, late 90s, early 2000s. People did a lot of really interesting work on this problem that we call the exploration problem of figuring out how do we use information about how our model is at the moment to decide how to plan to get better data for, for informing the learning of that model. Uh, my little graph here is just the idea that uh, epsilon greedy is a way of exploring that just says, I'm gonna take actions at random. Uh, RMAX and MBIE are two different methods for actually using what's known to inform the, the uh, or use planning to actually gather the right kind of data to inform the model. And they're getting much higher reward on the scale for, for many different settings of their exploration parameters. So this, this was a critical problem. This kept me busy for a decade. Like I was really totally enthralled with the whole, uh, how do we do exploration question. Um, and so there's a lot that's known about this and, and, it's, and it's really interesting. And, it, and it, I think it's cool because it's, it means we, we're not just treating the model learner and the planner as just two completely independently developed modules, but letting them inform each other. But there's some more recent work that I thought was that, that, that gave a, a different take on this interaction between the model learner and the planner, which is that the, the planning process itself needs information uh, from the model about its confidence, about how well it understands the environment to, do, to make the best plans that it can. So um, this was first, I think laid, laid bare in a paper by Jiang et al that showed that, um, well, in their work, what they did, let me, let, me, let me switch to the graph for a second. So what I'm trying to show with this graph is something that looks a little bit like an overfitting curve in standard supervised learning. And what the idea is, We've learned a model to some degree of accuracy. It's very difficult to learn a perfect model. So there's gonna be some uncertainty, especially early on. And now we wanna say, how can we use that model to, do, to make the best possible plan we can in the actual environment? So the blue line in this picture, just ignore the axes for a moment, or at least ignore the X axis, but the, the Y axis is how much reward is the, is the plan able to obtain? And the X axis is essentially how hard are we gonna push the planner to find the best plan? If we don't push on the far left, if we don't push the planner very hard, it doesn't find a very good plan. If you look at the blue line, the harder we push the planner, the better the plan is, okay. But the red line is how well does that plan do not in the model of the environment, but in the actual environment, okay? Which is necessarily distinct from what was learned about the environment. In the limit, maybe they're the same, but we're never in the limit. So. Um, 
what the red line is showing is if we don't push that planner hard enough, then we're not going to make a plan that works well in the real world. But if we push the planner too hard, we're also going to find a plan that doesn't work as well in the real world. We want to push it just the right amount. And that amount depends on the confidence level in the model. So if the, if the model is perfect, then we can push it all the way to the side. But if the model is very approximate, then we need to push it only a little bit. Now, this pushing that I'm describing as pushing the planner uh, can take a couple different forms. In the Zhang et al. paper, they looked specifically at manipulating the discount factor. So in uh, you know, discounted expected reward decision making, what we're interested in is maximizing reward where future rewards are discounted by the number of steps in the future they are. They're kind of squelched down by, by a certain amount that depends on how far in the future they are. And so the true discount factor of the environment, what we're actually using to measure performance in the environment, we want to use a smaller discount factor closer to zero, which means a shorter horizon, not planning as deeply into the future on our learned model than we would on the true environment. Okay, so that's what they showed in their paper. We showed that the same thing holds for uh, how you can take, you can make actions stochastic a little bit to, just to kind of noise them up a little bit where uh, maximum pushing of the planner is to say, well, you can deterministically choose what action to take in a state. And then backing off from that, you can suggest <laughs> what action to take in a state, but it's going to, but noise is going to be added to it. The less well learned the planner was, the more we wanted to add noise to the actions when we were actually generating the plan, not just at execution time, but at planning time itself, that it's just harder to control the environment. And that's capturing in part the fact that we just don't know exactly how the environment really works. Uh, this particular graph that I actually am showing here is uh, the number of hidden units that we're using in a neural network representation of the policy. More hidden units generally means that there's more capacity to learn a really intricate plan, whereas uh, fewer hidden units mean that it's going to have to learn a, a rule that is pretty simplistic and, and might not actually cover all the different cases particularly well. And what we found is that we wanted to use fewer hidden units to learn to, to make a plan that was going to work well in the real environment than we would to make it work well in the, in the modeled environment, the, envi the model of the environment that we, that we learned from experience. OK, all right, so deep planning. Uh, so, so OK, this, this <laughs> what's going on here? Well, partly what's going on here is that there is this sort of really in interesting interaction between the thinking that you know how the world works and actually knowing how the world works. And that when we plan, we need to know how the world works well. If we don't know how the world works perfectly, we need to be more careful and we need to gather more data to make it work out. And I think for these reasons, if we just throw deep learning, vanilla statistical deep learning at this problem, it ends up being really hard. There, there are algorithms in the literature that purport to learn models from sensory information like pixels or camera images and then plan with them. And they have cool names like imagination and stuff like that. But, uh, but I think none of them really work. And I say this not from reading the papers, because I read the papers and I believe they work. But then I ask my students to implement them. And then we run them and they don't work. They don't work on our problems in our way. They do work in the paper on the problems that were selected. And so part of that is because I think some of these methods lack generality. Like they work great for the problem that they're tested on in the paper but they're not sufficiently general that you can then take them out of that context, try them someplace else and expect them to, to work well. And in some cases, the ones that do seem to be working pretty consistently uh, on a variety of test problems, they're not really learning planable models. They're not actually learning a thing that you can take out of context and ask to solve other problems. The task that they're solving and the model thing that they're learning are really deeply integrated with each other and can't be teased apart again. I'm sure that, you know, like, I feel like the chat should now get on fire because I think everybody has kind of a favorite deep learning algorithm that they claim can do this sort of thing. And you might be right. And if you're right and I'm wrong, I would like to hear about it. So it's fine to tell me I'm wrong. But I've been, I've been let down many, many times. I've been down this road of like, they did it. They finally solved it. Let's use this only to discover that it's, it's not working for me. Uh, so what's the problem here? Part of the problem here is that small model errors are amplified. Maybe, maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's part of what's going on. Oh, cool. You can write on my slide. You can, if you need to ask me a question, that's a good thing to do. Just scribble. 
Um, all right, so you know, there's reasons to believe that that's part of what's going on here, that, uh, that because these models aren't perfect and now we're planning deep into the future with them, small errors get magnified. And it's worse than that because errors someplace in the model, the planner being a smart planner seeks out the errors, especially the ones that are um, beneficial, right? That look beneficial. It's going to find the parts of the state space where the model's wrong specifically in a way that makes it, the world look better than it really is. And so it's not just amplified by the fact that we're, we're sequencing, we're, we're composing these actions with each other. It's also because the planner is actively seeking out uh, certain kinds of errors in the model. So I would like to tell you the fix for this, but I don't have it. I don't think anybody's really said what it is yet, but there are hints out there. There are ideas that I think are particularly promising for trying to, if we could just integrate them together in the right way, we could, we could take a, a big step forward. So the first idea I want to mention, let's, let me just check on time here. So uh, the, I, I have until half past or 30, right? And then, and then it's questions, or do I need to leave time before that for questions? The people are nodding, but that doesn't help me because I asked, I didn't ask a yes, no question. First of all, 30 minutes and then 10 minutes. Before. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to say too much about this, but abstraction and hierarchy have to be part of this in some way or another. Uh, the notion that uh, the, the low level details of the soup where uh, we're, we're, we're using the pixels, we're using the, the center angles and the force angles of a robot or something like that. Um, we need to somehow pop up to a higher level to think about bigger chunks. And that means making abstractions in the state space, but also in the action space. So don't just think about how much force you're putting on the, on the on the joint, but think about, oh, I'm trying to get to this other place in the environment. You know, thinking at a, at a higher level is gonna make the planning problem more effective because, well, for one thing, uh, it's, it's the, we're not stringing as many small errorful actions together. We're making smaller compositions, which means the error can't blow up quite as much. Uh, my colleague in my department, George Conadaris, has done some really neat work of actually taking this kind of soupy sensory information and turning them into planning actions, planning representations that you can actually generate sequential plans with. Uh, in this particular, let's see, I, let me run this example and maybe I can talk it at the same time. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm going to turn the volume down, sorry. There we go. Okay. All right. So this is a robot that's in front of a cooler and it's in front of a cabinet or a cupboard. Uh, and it's trying to move a bottle from the cooler to the cupboard, but it only has its two hands and to open the cabinet, it needs both of them. So it didn't, even though it opened up the cooler to reveal the bottle, it hasn't picked up the, the bottle yet. First, it has to make sure that there's a place for it in the cupboard. And so now it's opened the cupboard. Once there's the, the cupboard is all set, now it can actually return to the bottle pick the bottle out of the cooler, walk it back to the cupboard, put it in the cupboard, close it up, close up the, uh, the cooler, and then it's, then it's actually done. So the total number of actions that it's actually taking at the level where it's doing the planning is what I have listed there on the left, open cooler, move to cupboard, and so on. So it actually strings all of those together successfully to accomplish the task. The way it's doing that is it actually generates planning operators, things that say, the move to cooler action says, well, there's a, there's a precondition, which is we, we need symbol one to be true. And it learns symbol one. It learns symbol one to basically mean I'm in front of the cooler facing the cooler. And what it learns is if I take the move to cooler action, that symbol goes away and a new symbol appears, which is essentially that it's in front of the cupboard facing the cupboard. So these are real planning actions that it can actually sequence together to, to accomplish a plan. The cheat here is that the actions like move to cooler implemented on the physical robot hardware was done by George. So by George, I think he cheated. He actually created these kind of uh, skills and then learned from interaction with the environment, a representation of the environment that, it, that allowed it to sequence those skills in a meaningful way. But he had to pick the skills. So it's not, this is not the whole story yet, but it's just a, it's a beautiful hint of what might be possible. Another idea in addition to abstraction that I think is the part of the story here is all the methods that I know of that really try to reason about an, an environment from low level inputs, use local data integrated with global data. And what I mean here is that the operators themselves are defined in terms of what's going on around the agent itself. And then those 
operators have to be embedded into the actual complete environment so that you can string things together to get something done. But both of those pieces are actually important. If you just focus on the full environment, you don't get operators that generalize in a meaningful way. You can't really sequence them because it's just, this is the thing you do when you're at that place. And so they're not modular. And so again, I'm not gonna to say too much more about this, but, but I, think, I think this use of local data is really important. This is another one of uh, George's project, projects that I have on the screen uh, that he did with Stephen James, where they learned uh, to get around in Minecraft and, and another kind of video game environment, again, by extracting planning operators and then using those planning operators, sequencing them to try to figure out how to actually accomplish goals. I'm gonna spend Maybe, maybe my remaining time on this, on this idea, which I think gets, doesn't get enough love, <laughs> but I think is actually really, really important. And that is that good planners need certain, certain structures to be true in the environment. And I think it's very often the case that we try to build learning algorithms that go bottom up. They take the information that we've got about from the sensors and try to accrete them into bigger and bigger structures. But really, we need, we, it matters the structures that we end up with at the end. They need to be sort of planning friendly structures. So what about this? What if we just say, hey, there's a bunch of planning structures that we, that we wish were true in the world. Can we reason top down to, to figure out how the low level sensory information is actually an instantiation of that high level idea that we already know how to solve? It's like, I already have my planning structure, my planning um, kind of framework. And now I go looking for it in the world. How is the low level information in the world? How can I view that as an instantiation of this bigger structure? So there's a, a paper by Peter Stone and some of the students back from 2006 that really kind of opened my ideas to this particular perspective. They were doing the general game playing competition, which was a thing back then, uh, where they were given really low level logical representations of a game that didn't look like a game. Like if I showed you chess, if I told you in advance you were playing chess, you would build a certain kind of planner, a certain kind of search algorithm that would allow you to play chess very well. But what's happening in the general game playing system is you don't get to do that in advance. A low level detailed logical description of how everything about the game works in this general format is presented to the, to the machine and the machine has to figure out how to play at a high level. And what their system did, which I thought was just a revelation, is they, they knew in advance there was only certain kinds of games that they were gonna be able to reason about. Things that had uh, numerical relationships among the symbols, uh, counters, uh, positions on a board, a notion of a board, markers on a board, pieces that are moving around a board, quantities, things that might be maximized. So they went looking in the details of the logical representation they were given for patterns that actually match these high level concepts. And if they could find them, and in all the games, actually, they could because they, they, they had a really good vocabulary of high-level concepts, then they had a high-level description that they could apply high-level search algorithms to solve. We did a little bit of this in some, some work that we did on planning with abstract Markov decision processes, where we just we hand-built a, a, a stack of different uh, Markov decision processes, different different environment models uh, from a very low level robot centric one to a higher level sort of graph moving around in, in a graph or moving objects around as a, as a classical planner would uh, kind of perspective. And at each level, it's using the kind of planner that makes sense for that level, but then they're all integrated together. So this is sort of top down, the top level kind of believes that the lower levels are gonna do their job sort of perspective. We don't make it bubble all the way up. We actually allow the, the, the decision-making to happen in a top-down way. And then and I think I might be a minute over. Uh, I think curricula are gonna be actually really important for this because there's no way these, these, these search bases, these problems that we want these, these critters to solve, our programs to solve are really just too big and too combinatorial. There's too many ways you can imagine putting all the pieces together. And so I think it's really important to focus on taking a representation that's been learned so far and then search for representations that are close to it, that, that you know, th these pieces have already earned their keep. And now we're gonna compose those pieces in different ways. And so we, we instantiated this idea in one, one sim uh, system where we're actually training an agent to, uh, to carry out various kinds of tasks that were specified as linear temporal logic uh, expressions. And the way that people naturally did this and the way that our algorithm was able to exploit it was people tended to teach simple, uh, simple tasks first, like go to the table, 
go to the fridge, go back and forth between the, go from the table to the fridge, go back and forth between the table and the fridge. So, so they, they, they think of the big task as actually being made of smaller tasks. And then they showed the, the agent, they taught the agent how to do the simpler tasks and sort of counted on it, combining those pieces together to learn the bigger task. So, all right, so for me, the upshot here is that we need something like planning for real decision-making, real high, kind of deep sequences of actions uh, to solve problems in the real world. Uh, that the RL and planning perspectives are really complementary and they belong together. They, they are necessarily of a piece. Um, though at this point, we still need better ways to extract and use symbols to actually connect this, this low level soup to the higher level logical representation. Thank you. <laughs>